forest edge species uh, rely on the transition between one habitat patch or, uh, and another, uh, typically between older forest and younger forest. Many of our game species fall into this category, including white-tailed deer, uh, ruffed grouse. Uh, game, game abundance is greater in these areas because a greater variety of habitat conditions converge in this one area, and also because this convergence results in unique habitat features that are only found where habitat patches overlap. Here's an example of, of what you could consider a soft, a soft edge between an open agricultural field and mature forest land in the background. The edge consists of, of the brushy vegetation between the two habitats. In the case of white-tailed deer, at the you know at the edge in this particular edge habitat, they have the ability to um, to get at both palatable browse and cover. Uh, you know both of these things, browse and cover, are available in close proximity. But too much edge can be a bad thing. Um, fragmentation. Uh, habitat discontinuity, the, you know, these can be bad things. At some point, you're only left with habitat to support edge species and the whole suite of other species that rely on larger blocks of intact habitat, whether that's large blocks of early succession habitat or large blocks of late succession habitat. All those species are lost. Um, there may also be an increase in predation of some species with increased edge. Uh, there, the effect of edge may influence the species composition, uh, the vegetative species composition of more interior forests up to 100 feet or so moving into those, into those intact blocks. This image displays the, the theoretical effect of fragmentation and edge on wildlife species. What occurs is a gradual reduction in the abundance of forest interior species like black bear and a gradual increase in the abundance of edge species like white-tailed deer. Riparian zones or areas of forest land directly adjacent to water courses are ecologically important, uh, especially in the context of wildlife management. These areas where water and nutrients are not typically limited uh, tend to be highly productive in terms of, of vegetation. Vegetative species diversity also tends to be greater in these areas as well. Riparian areas support upland wildlife species, but they also support uh, they also provide the ecological conditions necessary to support riparian specialists like like beaver and mink as well. In a broader ecological sense, these forested riparian buffers also maintain water quality and protect streams from adverse temperature changes. Um, as well as sedimentation from erosion. So another another really important uh, ecological function of riparian buffers, especially where they run adjacent to agricultural land, is the ability of the riparian buffer to filter out nutrients, right? Especially where you have agricultural land that's heavily fertilized, that nutrient, those nutrients that don't get used, tend to run off into the nearest water course. Forested buffers, forested riparian areas have the ability to filter out those those nutrients before they reach the water. And so really, really quickly here we're going to look at three relatively common wildlife species in the southern Appalachians in terms of their habitat needs just to kind of wrap this lecture up. So the white-tailed deer is one of the most important wildlife species in the southeast, both, both economically and ecologically. It is classified as an opportunistic herbivore. Uh, it, just, it feeds on a, on a variety of things, fruits, hard mast, grasses, flowers, leaves, buds, and a variety of herbaceous species. Again, this species really thrives in this edge type of habitat where there's a collision, a collision between intact forest land and open land or really young forest land where there's food and cover in close proximity. It's relied upon heavily as a food source for hunters. We have essentially taken over the role of predator. Uh, most of the pr natural predators of white-tailed deer no longer exist. Um, if they do exist, they exist in, in really small numbers. And also, uh, impor it's important to recognize that white-tailed deer is a keystone species 
in, in many of these ecosystems. What that means is the presence of, of white-tailed deer and the, and the changes that, the, that white-tailed deer cause within the ecosystems that they reside in um, are important for other species as well. Other species rely on the presence of white-tailed deer to survive. the you know where the whereas the white-tailed deer is really tolerant of frequent human interaction black bears are not in North Carolina black bears are most abundant in the coastal plain and in the Appalachian Mountains where they are relatively free from human interference they require large areas of forest land with a variety of food and a variety of, of cover sources large cavity trees those are you know most abundant in older patches of forest land are their preferred denning sites uh, bears do well where there are a variety of successional stages of forest land present, but the quality of their habitat goes down um, as the pressures of residential development and road construction increase. Wild turkey are found in a variety of forest types in the southeast. Uh, they do require a source of hard mast, uh, you know, in the f typically in the form of acorns. So um, having oak species present um, is an important thing. They they also require patches of open land um, to to forage for insects and 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 both and to and to eat herbaceous material as well. Uh, a nearby consistent source of water is essential. Um, turkeys will roost in a variety of tree species, but typically prefer conifer species. So again, kind of another species that is uh, can adapt to a lot of different forests and conditions, but there's a few things that it requires, um, you know, to consider. Uh, there's a few things that are needed for an area to be considered high quality habitat.